mighty phantoms of the evening sky. To whom do these celestial steeds belong? When you appear to us like gods on high, what brings you here to mystify? Hi, and thanks for tuning in to the Kate Valentine UFO Show on 1160 WVNJ. A very special guest today, Dr. Thomas Stryker. He is the author of the book, Extraplanetary Experiences, subtitled Alien Human Contact and the Expansion of Consciousness. Dr. Stryker, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks, Kate. Thank you for the welcome and invitation. I look forward to speaking with your guests, and I hope we can be successful in bringing some new awareness in. Well, that would be great. Um, now, in your book, what you want to do is explore alien-human contact and the resulting expansion of human consciousness. How did you ever come up with that? What made you think to do this? Because it's, it's a very interesting approach, and I really liked it. It was, very, it was a fascinating book. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's been a lifelong passion for me to pursue this area because I was an early experiencer, and so I had a, a difficult time unraveling my experience um, as, you know, it happened as a young child. It took years and years to unravel that experience, and I really didn't have much support mm. or places to go, books to read that could help me, if you will, assimilate my process of getting through this experience. So um, another reason I wrote the book, to help other experiencers uh, through their somewhat trauma as when it first starts, you know, it's hard to understand an anomalous experience. And uh, this book, I think, would benefit people who even have that kind of doubt of there ever being this type of phenomenon. Uh, y yeah, it must have been very difficult, especially as a child. Uh, Stan Romanek was on, and he said the same thing, and that was the purpose for his writing his book, too, to, uh, I guess, just to have other people realize that they were not alone, that they weren't crazy, that these things are happening. Yeah, I think it's, you know, it's beyond, you know, the point of craziness. When, it, when you have a an anomalous ex or an extraordinary experience of this type, mm. it's, um, I think there's just a... A willingness, you know, by the experiencer to to want further explanations and further answers. It, it's not so much for me anyway of feeling I was crazy. I just had to unravel this, you know, some way of understanding it. Uh, and I think that was just a process of maturing and uh, gathering more information from the outside world. And also, you don't seem to, or at least most of the experiencers I've spoken to, don't seem to get a lot of help in understanding it from the other side. Uh, it, it seems like it comes out and drips, in, almost as if it would be too much for a human being to understand if they uh, just put it down on you all at one time. Yes, I think when you say, you know, getting help otherwise, you know, I mean, like from consensus reality or mainstream um, dominant worldview, it's just not there right now because most of those people have not had that type of experience. So it, it's interesting, even in the clinical aspect of, you know, psychotherapy and things like this, if the therapist is not trained in extraordinary type experiences, they have a habit of coming from their own reality, right. which of course can be very prejudicial or, you know, selective. Absolutely. Well, I, I think uh, it would be interesting for the audience to know that you uh, w uh, studied with Dr. John Mack at one time. Yes, that was uh, a real wonderful experience. Yeah, it Go must ahead. have been. It had to have been. And it was a difficult, you know, getting a hold of John because I was basically faced with an ultimatum. If I couldn't get an expert in the field um, to get on my dissertation committee, I couldn't do my dissertation. Oh. And so I was basically forced to find an expert because the school had nobody that could take this on so they said well you find somebody that's an expert in the field and we'll let you do the dissertation here and i said well who do you mean who's an expert to you, you wow. Know? wow i said if you could get dr john mack we'll allow you to do it here oh. so i pursued that for months and um, i went through uh, at the time you know uh, john mack was a tenured harvard professor pulitzer prize winner you know world-renowned author and researcher so he was very difficult to get a hold of. I went through his 
his, uh, his secretary for months just pleading with her. Mm-hmm. Could John please call me you know, or talk about this, you know, the possibility of us doing this together? And finally, she said, okay, he's going to call you tonight at 7 o'clock. Be home. <laughs> you know, so, and he did. He called me at exactly 7 o'clock, and we talked, and it's all it took. We, I think we resonated really well together on the topic, and he knew I was serious about the topic, and he just uh, he signed on immediately. He said, okay, I'll call the school, and I'll get the papers signed, and we're ready to go. Unfortunately, you know, John Mack died six months later. Oh, you know, so I, didn't, was, I didn't realize it was that close afterwards. Yeah, oh. yeah, it was six months well, uh, just to get back to Dr. Mac too a little bit, uh, you said that you, in interviewing the people that you did for your book, you sort of uh, took his pattern of interview interviewing witnesses of sort of uh, not so much paranormal events, but I guess uh, how would you describe them? Just uh, extraordinary, extraordinary events. Yeah, ex- extraordinary type of events. Uh, most of John dealt with, you know, in, in his books, you know, Passport to the Cosmos and abduction, those were um, considered alien abduction um, uh, case scenarios. So uh, he had a technique that he used. It was called witnessing, Mm -hmm. and that's what I used. uh, I tried to, you know, learn from John about how to be more of a a better listener, you know, when dealing with people who have had extraordinary experience. And this fit right in for me because I felt I was in the same ballpark. And nobody really could understand my experience when I tried to explain to them. I said, "Oh, I need to learn, you know, how to be a better listener about extraordinary type experiences, and how do I do it?" So John had a, a really, a really great uh, protocol, you know. And first of all, is pro- you need to be able to process your own experience, which uh, you know uh, by that time I was able to. And then, um, you know, he taught me things like uh, sympathetic resonance, like really, you know understanding, you know, from a heart level, you know, from a sympathetic emotional level, what this person may have gone through. And that's different than somebody, you know, that's just sitting there listening on a cognitive level. So there's a, there's a bunch of other scenarios that are brought in, you know, from a, um, if you will, intuitive, you know, type of, uh, uh, background to understand the experience at a deeper level. So it would mean like if I was listening, you, if you were wanting to tell me about an ex- extraordinary experience that you claim to have had, you know, there's ways that we could start off talking about it, but then I'd be asking you certain questions, how to go in deeper with you about it, you know, like trying to understand the, how you felt about whatever it was you were doing, going into some of the emotional elements, the spiritual elements, and really I think that with most of these extraordinary experiencers, if it is ringing true with both, you know, it really is a catalyst for the whole investigation, or if you will, the interview, to proceed in a way that's very deep and knowledgeable. Because it's more of a resonating thing. Like, okay, here I am, you know, listening and being the interviewer, and the interviewees, you know, sitting next to me, and we both have really similar type experience. We just got to get on the same wavelength, if you will. Well, I, I think it's important because most of the uh, the events that you describe are those that, if you spoke to a person who had no interest in this field and no experiences. I think they would just start saying, well, you know, that's just silly stuff, and walk away. And then, of course, you clam up right away. So, yeah, it had to have been very important for you to do that. We had a comment come in from uh, Bobby who said, uh, as far as these experiences go, sometimes they come in different segments, almost like a movie. And part of many abductions are tests as well. Maybe it's sort of like... Uh, just to follow through on that, maybe you have to have a certain level of understanding before you can go to the next level, which would make sense, I guess. Well, I think that's what we're calling the assimilation process, you okay. know, and it's a process people go through, and it takes years, literally years. And that's what I really brought out in my book, you know, the experiences yes. that I interviewed. You know, they had, most of them, lifelong experiences. It wasn't just like, you know, one day they had this experience and everything was clear to them. It was mm-hmm. nothing like that. It was a matter of sometimes 30, 40, 50 years of continually working on the experience, and then other experiences came 
and evolve through that first initial experience. So it's, you know, it's a compilation of experiences, and, but the most important key here is the assimilation process. And how, how does a person look at it? How are they working on it? How are they trying to integrate it into their consciousness? And, you know, you could imagine there's a lot of fear for a lot of people in the beginning because it's just the unknown. And then there's, in some cases, there, there's even, you know, something called ontological shock where their whole world view has been shattered, if you will. You know, they've seen something that just doesn't make any sense. Here's a being that comes in, uh, manifests in their living room, and walks through a wall. You know, it's like that's hard to understand, you know, from the paradigm that we're at in consensus reality. So there's all this processing that takes place, and I think that we're moving forward in a, in a, in a rapid pace right now because there's more people becoming available to help people uh, work through their assimilation process much quicker than it was in the past. And, and it seems like the interest in this subject and uh, alien contact is getting uh, greater and greater and much more acceptable than it was even five or ten years ago. We certainly have that correct. You know, since I put the book out, it's only been a couple of months. I've been on 30 shows. Really? <laughs> yes. Um, you know, different degrees. I've been on Coast to Coast. Um, you know, oh, yeah, there's a lot of people that really are trying to understand it more thoroughly or their experiences themselves and want to comment. Right now I, I received author of the month from, uh, it's called the Graham Hancock Award. It's uh, GrahamHancock.com. I'm oh, answering good. people's questions on there right now. Congratulations. And, That's, uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so you're right. You know, it's really, I think I, I just feel like it's such a... <laughs> Um, being in the right place at the right time, time right now. <laughs> yes, well, sometimes life does work <laughs> well for you. We're yeah. going to take a quick break. This is Kay Valentine. I'm speaking to Dr. Thomas Stryker on 1160 WVNJ. Dr. Stryker is the author of the book, Extraplanetary Experiences, subtitled Alien Human Contact and the Expansion of Consciousness. We're going to be right back after break, but we'd love to hear from you then. We'd love to know, have you had any experiences along those lines? You can post them now on our website, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. Hi, welcome back to the Kate Valentine UFO Show on 1160 WVNJ. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Stryker. He is the author of Extraplanetary Experiences, Alien-Human Contact, and the Expansion of Consciousness. So what are your thoughts? You can post them right now on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. Uh, Dr. Stryker, Bobby uh, said uh, it's interesting that his uh, his experience were all non-stop. First he sees UFOs quite a bit, then visitors, then dreams, tests, and then for about five no months now, nothing. So it seems like um, that's sort of the way it goes. But getting back to your book, Extraplanetary Experiences, uh, how did you happen to pick the seven people that you did? And more to the point, how did you get an interview with Dr. Edgar Mitchell? He is a difficult person to uh, have an interview with. He's rather private. Yes. Um, well, even more private is Ingo Swan. You know, so both of oh, the oh. very first oh, interview was, was with Edgar Mitchell. The last one was with, uh, oh, you he, know, the psychic and remote viewer, Ingo Swan. He got so snarky in the interview. <laughs> but you published it, though. <laughs> he does. But, you know, beyond that fact, oh. I went out there to visit with him, and uh -huh. uh, we personally had a discussion for many, many hours. So I see. he wanted to, you know, represent himself in that way, which, you know, not that he wanted to be disliked, but he wanted to let people know that it was a scientific experiment. Yes, he know? was very so. definite with that. But, you know, of course, if you read any of Ingo's books, you know, like To Kiss Earth Goodbye or Penetration, he gives a whole other account of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But in this interview, he wanted to let me know that, you know, this, this was a scientific experiment. So we just let it at that. And I'm, I'm just so glad I got the interview in there into the book. So, But, yeah, Edgar Mitchell, yes, um, he was <clears throat> really open-hearted about the interview. He was, He wanted to be a part of it right from the beginning so it was not difficult because i think he understood it uh, what i was looking at and also because he's involved in some of the schools that i'm associated with you know he, uh, edgar of course is he founded the uh, institute of noetic sciences you know on you know a 
above San Francisco there, and I was in graduate school at uh, in Palo Alto and uh, San Francisco area. So you know, <clears throat> a lot of times, <clears throat> excuse me, um, a lot of times he may have contact with some of the mentors that I had. And so, yeah, he was willing to get involved in this uh, from the get-go. He is a very busy man, too. I remember I doing the interview in an airport, <laughs> in oh, the San Francisco seriously? airport, oh. Oh. <laughs> as he was awaiting his next flight. So, uh, you know, <laughs> pretty interesting. Uh, since then, though, I, I talked to Dr. Mitchell quite often and you know, on the phone, and a uh, very nice, friendly man. So I'm really happy about that. Well, his was sort of a two-part experience. Uh, uh, experience, if you'd like. Uh, he definitely is a brilliant uh, astronautical type of background. I mean, PhD from MIT and so on. And uh, uh, he did a wonderful job as an astronaut. It was when he came back in his book, The Way of the Explorer, he was saying, uh, and I remember this, he said that the shuttle or the spacecraft that he was in was rotating and that the astronauts called it the barbecue mode because it would just keep <laughs> turning. Yeah. yeah. And that's when he had his epiphany. And so he changed from this very, very scientific, very straightforward type of uh, no-nonsense guy, although he did have an experiment on the moon. But still, from that type of a scientific approach to the noetic approach, and that epiphany, I think, is what probably made him very sympathetic to your book and your approach. Yes, because, you know, he explains that, too. He's still unraveling the experience of going to the moon, stepping out. Oh, you know. That must be unbelievable. I mean, uh, it's scary, too. I mean, uh. Yes, but then the most unbelievable part of it, he said when he was returning back to the Earth and seeing the Earth out there and going towards it, you know, he said that was most mm. complex of anything. It's like, where have I been? What's this about? Who am I? Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> all those, you know, those those huge, meaningful questions we ask ourselves sometimes, you know, it's like, who are we, right? So. I think, you know, to this day, you know, Edgar is now in his 80s, so he's still unraveling the mystery, which I really like, because, you know, it really helps people understand that there there is no right or wrong way, and there's a lot of gray matter in in life, you know, that we have to just, like, I'm not sure what that's about. Maybe if, you know, maybe in my lifetime I might be able to answer that, maybe not. Well, well, you know, you, uh, your book, of course, is based on the uh, your interviews with seven people that claim to have been on other planets, moons, or stars. Now, it, uh, obviously, Edgar Mitchell was very easy to accept that. He was on the moon, and millions of people were aware of uh, Many millions of people were aware of that. With your other subjects, it was a little bit more difficult to, um, you know, it was harder for a person without... Uh, that type of uh, an interest or a background, such as like out-of-body experiences or remote viewing, uh, to accept. How how do you how did like people that you don't that are not in these studies with you, like um, somebody you just meet, whatever, at a social event, how do they feel about these events? Well, of course, you know, if you know, if I go to a social event, it depends on who's there, but most people are convinced of consensus reality and dominant worldview, so they're not going to be looking at a lot of my experiencers as being sane people, just to be honest with you. And I bring this out in the book, you know, that these experiencers deal with this all the time, but, you know, I always say the difference between the mystic and the schizophrenic is that the mystic knows who not to talk to. Okay. (laughs) Hopefully. (laughs) Very good. (laughs) You know, so they just learn to be more discerning on who they talk to. But so, you know, I'm ready for that, too, when I talk to people about this topic. You know, I know that there's a lot of debunkers out there, and that's okay. I I don't need to get in, you know, long-winded discussions and try to convince them. You know, it's past that point because there's so much going on right now that we, uh, you know, just need to center and focus on on how to keep this moving, you know, in the way it's moving right now. When I say that, I mean that there's a lot of more extraterrestrial contact going on uh, with a lot more people. So. Well, I'll tell you, Dr. Stryker, if someone wants to uh, find out for themselves, have them read your book, Extraplanetary Experiences. This is Kate Valentine, 1160 WVNJ. So, yeah, just to get back, and I, but uh, they were very open with you about their, and I guess that was the... Um, sort of the 
MO that you had of interviewing these people because they were very open with you about their experiences. And you're right, a lot of people would not have believed them, would have just said, oh, you know, these people are just making it all up. And they they were very straightforward with you. Well, I think a lot of that has to do, again, I think they could trust me in how I was interviewing them, and I wasn't trying to condemn them or psychopathologize them, because yeah. a lot of people say, yeah. oh, God, this guy's a psychologist, or, you know, he's a doctor, or whatever, you know, there's all these stereotypes that come up. And I think, you know, once they, you know, I met with them or talked with them, they could see I wasn't coming from the typical background that maybe a clinician or somebody would be coming from. Because of that had to do with my own personal experience, and that's what I keep bringing back up is that mm-hmm. I think because of that personal experience, they were able to maybe be a little bit more open with me and and trusting because they knew that I was you know resonating with them. You know, I wasn't out like I said to to ostracize them anymore or to <clears throat> pathologize them. And, and I think it's necessary for someone that's had an experience like that to tell somebody about it. I mean, that's just human nature. I mean, uh, I, you know, again, it's that old saying, be careful what you wish for, but I have never, to my knowledge, been abducted. But if that should happen, I certainly would want to tell someone about it. And, you know, who do you speak to about something like that? You know, I mean, most people in your daily life, if you tell them a little gray person came through the uh, wall one night and I took a spacecraft to Venus, they would be saying, hmm, and I would be getting a rolled eyeball, I'm sure. So it would be nice for them to have a place to discuss this with someone that would take them seriously. Well, that's it. You know, I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, the support is really important in in a, in a situation like this, you know. And I understand that because I went through something very similar. So I I reach out even further when somebody starts talking about something that you know, other people are ready you know, stereotypically saying, well, that, that couldn't have happened, you know, because if that would have happened, it would have happened to me. I would know everything about that. <laughs> you know, those are the kind of right. comments I get, you know, for even really well-educated people. They say, well, if that was really happening, you know, Dr. Stryker, I'd be, you know, I would have had that experience too. Right. You know, so. Right. I, so it's, it's kind of interesting how uh, some people can be, you know, like that, but it's, you know, it's just the way it is, and I have to accept that part of it also, and uh, just try to um, create the support for the people that need it. Well, it seems that to me that of all the interviews you did, all of them were uh, very positive. They, uh, the experiences that these people had were, once they adopted to it, were very beneficial to them. Yeah, that was one of the, the points of the study was that we found out, when I say points, I mean the common themes we called. I did something called yes. thematic content yeah. analysis, you know, and basically it's just going through the interviews and pulling out important themes, you know, that, that come up. And, you know, after reading all of them several times, you know, I was like, okay, yes, these were all positive to these people. They, they learned something from the experience. They got a better idea of what, you know, a more, uh, what should I say, open mind about the cosmos. And I think that was a real the positive part about it was that they understood that the cosmos was not this dark, alienated place that, you know, was out to hurt them or just some dark matter out there. It was teeming with life. Yeah, and, and I, I think sometimes people don't realize it, but I, I think humans sometimes get the feeling that we're stranded out here in the middle of nowhere on a little rock, and uh, God only knows what else is out there. And I, I think it is important to realize that maybe the outside universe is not as unfriendly as the sci-fi movies make it out to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's an important point, you know, is what we see, you know, through media and, you know, movie coverage that, you know, those are a lot of times just meant to make profits, you know, <laughs> people you know, get out there and watch those movies. Um, and we got to look at the other part of this, you know, is look at the experiencers part and what they're trying to say, which will probably never be in a movie. But, uh, you know, the positive aspects of what, you know, extraterrestrials have to offer right now is a very important topic for a lot of people. Okay, well, I'll tell you, I, I'd like to uh, cover that uh, common things, uh, uh, common themes, excuse me, a little bit more. We are going to take like a quick break, but we'll be right back. This is Kate Valentine. I'm speaking to Thomas, Dr. Thomas Stryker, the author of Extraplanetary Experiences 
alien-human contact and the expansion of consciousness. We'll be right back. We'd really love to hear what your experience are or your views. Uh, you can post them right now on our website, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. Be right back. Hi, welcome back to the Cape Valentine UFO Show on 1160 WVNJ. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Stryker. He is the author of Extraplanetary Experiences, Alien Human Contact, The Expansion of Consciousness. So I'd like to hear what your thoughts. Has your consciousness been expanded? I hope so. Post it right now on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. You know what struck me about your book too, Dr. Stryker, was that the seven people that you interviewed had really different backgrounds, and yet you asked them the same questions. But what struck me even more was that um, the the questions you asked were more almost like a NASA debriefing. They were, you were very matter-of-fact, like, what was the planet you visited? What did it look like? What was the horizon? Did you see any other structures? Were there any habitation? You really were not into the spiritual side of it. You really were very matter-of-fact, and you got very matter-of-fact answers back. Well, thanks for bringing up that point. I think, yes, uh, it was. I think there was a spiritual content underlying all of this, though, and that was brought out in the common themes that all the interviewees uh, felt this was a spiritual experience for them. Mm-hmm. And so in the book, I, that's number actually number 25, I found 25 common themes so all the experiencers uh, believe that their experience was a you know spiritual experience. Yeah. Well, uh, Chris uh, just wrote in with a question: Have you found that the people you've interviewed have repeat trips? Oh uh, yes, most of them. Because um, these all these people that I interviewed were over fifty years old. They've been having experiences for a long time, and they continue to have experiences. So um, yes, you know to answer your answer your question it's it's an evolving um uh, new p- a part of their life you know that just continues on it's part of the assimilation process i i think that these people that i mentioned in the book will will continue to have experiences for as long as they want to for as long as they want to keep having them i mean there is a control factor here you know if they wanted to stop having them if they let's say they did no longer wish to participate in a relationship with they're having a relationship with the extraterrestrial that they can they can stop that well you said that uh, on the common themes that uh, their reports were all positive all of them felt that this was a very good thing almost uh, the one fellow said he felt euphoric yeah and some said ecstatic some would you know yeah. call it an epiphany like Edgar said and, you know real feeling a marvelous experience or glorious and yeah, all these positive things that they said about the experience. Mm-hmm. And and fear was not there. As a matter of fact, another common fear was it seemed to have removed the fear of death with these people. Yeah, after, you know, they they've had time. I mean, it wasn't there was fear for some of these people in the beginning because like I said the assimilation process was uh, you know, it took some time. I think there was some fear in the beginning because it was just such an awkward experience. Mm-hmm. And I think there was some shock for some people, but after they they got through it and understood it more readily, they were they were able to understand it more thoroughly. And after that, they said, "Well, gee, this taught me a lot, you know, in the short amount of time that I had this experience." And then they started looking at it, you know, a little bit more uh, rationally to the point where they understood it to be like these people or these beings are trying to help me understand something. You know, they looked at it more of a mentorship. And they were all quite certain that there were other intelligent beings in the universe. Definitely, that you know that was another common another common theme. Yeah, that, mm-hmm. it would be almost silly to think that there weren't. You know, uh, and, and Edgar Mitchell said, not a quote from your book. Oh, I have no doubt about it. The fact is that we have been visited. The whole UFO phenomenon, we have been visited, and I, I think he has knowledge that the. Uh, most of us are not really don't do not have access to that. 
Yes, he would. But, I, you know, I guess in, to answer your question about, we, I think we do have the knowledge, but it's like beyond our five senses. You know, it's up to us to develop those other senses. You know, I'm thinking more psychically now about developing, you know, uh, you know, intuition and, uh, you know, telepathy and uh, developing, you know, some skills that could be considered paranormal skills that people just don't even think about, don't even want to d- develop. But the people that have been working on those skills, I think, have been very successful in, you know, getting through this uh, process of working with extraterrestrials. Well, I mean, look at Ingo Swan with remote viewing, and uh, in your book you uh, talk about his success with describing the planet Jupiter before Voyager got there. It was quite a very, it was a beautiful description of the planet. almost made you want to go there. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> and, you know, it was... It was such a controversial, you know, statement that he made at the time because uh, that was not factual to the scientists. You know, it's it's like you going back and understand that it's a good example of how science, you know, you know, the history of science is more like a history of scientific revolutions. Yeah. You know what I mean by that? Yes. Right. Well, it's please like, you expound. Know, I, 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 yes, please go ahead with that. I didn't mean to. Yes, I know what you mean, but go. go. <laughs> or, or an example of that would be like, you know, even years ago when people reported and claimed that there are rocks falling from the sky, you know, the scientific establishment said, that's impossible, that can't be happening. It wasn't years and years later until they understood meteorites, yeah. you know, actually do fall from the sky and land on the earth. You know, So, so uh, Ingo Swan was, as far as I'm concerned, way ahead of his time, too, in a lot of things he did. And they, I think he... <laughs> he's just stuck with it and uh, you know he's so tenacious that they just stuck with him too into the sense that okay we're going to investigate this guy and that's why he likes people to know it was a scientific experiment but again it it was a um how would you say it was a talent that many people i think can develop and i think what stops them from doing it is thinking that they can't because uh there are if i if I'm correct, I may be wrong, uh, remote viewing classes that you can take that will help you develop that talent. That's true. Yeah, it's very true. And there's, there's classes available to different schools, and um, you can get you know involved in other ways too. But, uh, yes, there's ways of developing your, your psychic abilities. Everybody has them. And, and, you know, they have it to different degrees. I mean, you can certainly take uh, musical lessons, but some of us go on to be great uh, performers and others just sort of pound out chopsticks the rest of our life. And <laughs> it was well, true. You know, same with uh, the psychic abilities. And a yeah. friend of mine is very good at remote viewing, and I certainly am not. And um, it's, it's, uh, but I, I do think that there is a lot of ability there that we have been told we don't have. And so we figure, oh, okay, we don't have it. We never try to develop it well here again i think we're we're left with that portion of consensus reality and dominant worldview and a lot of people feel really safe and secure in there and they say well why do i want to go out of the box i feel so good in this box because everybody feels and thinks the same and it takes a step you know to, you know to opening that uh, the door a crack and saying well maybe there is something outside this box that's worthy of my investigating so there's some fear involved in that, okay, of leaving the, the if you will, the warm tippet pond. Oh, absolutely. Well, again, if I might quote from your book, Ingo Swan had a great saying. He said, uh, "You asked him, how do you think the experiment of describing Jupiter affected you?" And again, he said, eh, "Not very much." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know, but anyway. And then he went on to say, when you get too far outside of other people's reality boxes, they don't even know what you're talking about. And mm-hmm. they're probably not interested either. And I thought, wow, okay. <laughs> but it, he seemed to be so, um, you know, like Edgar Mitchell is, oh, he is just... Uh, so vitally interested in what he wants to say to other people. And Ingo Swan is sort of like, look, this is what it is, and you can take it or leave it. So you've interviewed some very different people. Very difficult people to interview also. You know, they're, you know, both Edgar and Ingo now are about 80 years old, so they don't want to be doing a lot of this anymore. You know, yeah. 
especially Ingo. He just just wants to be left alone now. He doesn't really want to do any more interviews. And I was like I said, I was really uh, fortunate to be able to do this one with him. And you know, he's another person that you know off the record that you know I can call and talk with him too. You know, so I like that. You know, I built up you know somewhat of a support group now since the book with these with these experiencers. And of course, it's always nice to have that net. You know, being able to call somebody, especially if I have a, I'm working with a client or working with an experiencer that I have some difficulty with. You know, I call these people. I say, hey, I this, you know, it doesn't sound, you know, doesn't sound very, uh, whatever the question may be, where, you know, there's more of a mystery involved that I can't unravel. I'll go to, you know, I'll, I'll talk with uh, Dr. Mitchell or Ingle Swan about it. You know, so it, I'm really glad that. Um, they are somewhat available to me right now. Yeah, I do are, need help with this. It's, you know, this is a, I'm tackling a huge project. Well, I'll tell you, you've gone right to the top. Um, we've had a, we have two interesting questions come in. Uh, Dale said, "Are these people being taken on a mental trip, or do, or do they believe they are actually physically on another planet? And if physically, how long are they gone? And how did? Oh, well, here's a good question. How did they get there that fast?" Right. Okay. Which one do you want me to answer? All, three. All of them. Or? All of them. <laughs> okay. How do you get there so fast? Well, here again, we're left with, um, you know, how a person looks at life. Now, there's ways of immediate travel, such as telepathy. It's almost like okay. snap of the snap of the the finger, and it can travel what we think are billions of miles. Now, how does that work, right? That's to us in a lot of ways. It's not possible because we're used to using telephones and radio transmissions. So it's it's a little bit different, you know, when you think this way. It's uh, understanding that there's a possibility of immediate connection and, and immediate uh, transference when we get on a certain level, a certain psychic level. Okay. Well, d- do they think they're actually physically there, do you think, or is it sort of a mental trip, I guess, for better... Oh, okay, sure. Well, there's been different accounts for different people. Some you know, are saying they're going there more etherically and uh, spirit-wise. Okay, an out-of-body experience, you're not taking your body. You're taking a part of, if you will, a part of your mind with you, okay? It's not to say that's not happening, but it's, to some people that's not considered a physical form. Mm. Yeah, um, so the out of body experience is just like what it says. You're not taking the body. And this comes down to all sorts of other problems for people because a lot of people do not believe that, that, that a part of the human body could exist past death, let's say. You know, that's the end for some people. But then there's other people that believe that, no, there's a part of us that lives on after death. Either it be the soul, the, the mind, consciousness. There's different names for it. So, we we have to um, understand different concepts, you know, that haven't been explored so readily in the past, and I think that's where some of this real doubting and debunking comes into because people just can't understand it. Uh, well, I, yeah, I think uh, you know, for the most of us, we need something to hang our hat on. And uh, D- uh, Bob Schroeder was on; he was talking about something called the bulk which is like a space between two uh, universes. And when you go in there, you can uh, then come out anywhere you want, and you can travel to something like Alpha Centauri in a blink of an eye. And, you know, that may or may not be true, but at least for the most of us, it gives us a little bit of a basis to uh, try to understand anyway. And maybe that's the wrong approach, but uh, anyway, I'm sorry. We have to take another short break. Sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, Kate Valentine here speaking to Dr. Thomas Stryker about his book, Extraplanetary Experiences, Alien-Human Contact, and the Expansion of Consciousness. We're on 1160 WVNJ. We want to hear from you. Please post your comments now on our website, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. We'll be right back after show. If you miss part
part of today's program or you'd like to hear it again, be sure to subscribe to the Kate Valentine UFO Show podcast. Go to Kate's website, AtlanticCoastUFOs.com, and sign up by entering your email address on the homepage. Every week, the show will be delivered right to you, so you'll never miss another intriguing, thought-provoking interview with the top names in the UFO field. Sign up today for the Kate Valentine UFO Show podcast at AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. Hi, welcome back to the Kate Valentine UFO Show on 1160 WVNJ. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Stryker. He is the author of the book, Extraplanetary Experiences, Alien Human Contact, and the Expansion of Consciousness. Uh, if you have any thoughts or questions, you can post them right now on AtlanticCoastUFOs.com. And Dr. Stryker, we had two very interesting questions come in. Uh, Tim says that there have been guests on this show that really did not appreciate their contact with ETs. They felt it was very frightening for them. These experiences that you are describing seem much more spiritual and open-minded. Uh, how do you suppose these experiences that you're describing were picked? It, 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 yeah, that's uh, a very interesting question. How are some picked and some not? Uh, when you say picked, what do you mean by that? Well, um, there is this alien presence, and they do want to make themselves known to these experiencers, and uh, there are some people that they make themselves known to and some not. Uh, and he was just wondering why someone would have this experience where someone else would not. Oh, okay. Well, that's a good question. That's yeah. a real good question. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, from just studying this for the last 10 years, that, you know, the number of experiences that I've talked to, they seem to be readily available, you know, to reciprocate a relationship with something they don't understand. Uh, where some people, there's a bigger fear factor. And I think, um, I want to, I don't want to skip that topic too, the ones that have been more of a, uh, more of a negative experience. I think it's the energy that the person puts out, you know, when they start the relationship with, um, I don't like using the word alien, actually. It's in my book because my publisher wanted that word. Okay. Uh, I, I prefer extraterrestrial. Okay. And um, the, the extraterrestrial beings sometimes get involved with a person that might be in fear, but I think the the bottom line is that usually after that experience, the, the fear remains, maybe even more so because, you know, this idea... I want to go back to that word I'm using before as assimilation. The person hasn't had time to assimilate the experience, so they think of it as a negative experience. Same with alien abduction experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, from my experiences, the ones that I've talked to in the beginning, it was a frightening, fearful experience. Um, after years of assimilation, of processing the event and what happened, um, they changed their mind. Not all of them, you know, but a good portion of them changed their minds. I really, that really wasn't a frightening, fearful experience. I, now that I've had time to think about it, you know, I think I was just locked in my fear and I couldn't accept what they were trying to teach me. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's kind of interesting how things change after a matter of time. But these people, um, that you were saying chosen, I, I don't really know about the chosen as much as open, being open to the phenomenon. And then things start happening. It's like they're saying, like, I'm already willing to have a relationship with a benevolent being. So I, when I say that, I mean, you should be careful and be discerning what kind of energy you put out when going into the unknown. Just like, you know, I think you got to be discerning on when we go out in public, what kind of people we want to attract, correct? Correct. Same well, thing. I, I, you can always find dark and evil people, you know, in the right places. Well, know? yeah, that's... <laughs> well, you know, but to bring that up, that is a cultural aspect, and I think that's why a lot of the fear is associated with them. For example, if you're asleep at night and you wake up and there's someone in your room, that's not a good thing, typically. And so when most of these alien contacts have been like that, it's sort of serendipitous. You wake up and suddenly they're there. And so whether they were uh, extraterrestrial or terrestrial, it's a frightening thing. So I think that cultural aspect of earthlings, let's say, or terrestrial people, has been somewhat ignored by people or, or beings that are extraterrestrial. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, the the example that you used about waking up and seeing a being in front of you, you know, is after a lot of assimilation with people that say they've had that experience, you know, they, find, they come to... Um, 
realize that they were having dreams about this years before, and it was a continuous evolving thing that happened. So mm-hmm. there again, we're, we're left with that assimilation process, mm-hmm. and, you know, sometimes it becomes conscious all of a sudden. You know, they've been dreaming about an experience with an extraterrestrial, maybe even going to another planet, then all of a sudden there it is in the physical form, or, you know, what they consider their more prominent reality, you know. So they were asking for it, but they just not in the physical form, and there it is, you know, it might be in the physical form. So it's, like I said, again, I think we really have to consider this assimilation process and where people are at at the time of the experience. Well, I, I think you're right, because so many guests on this show, when they relate their experiences, they say there was a childhood interaction, and frequently that took a place in the daytime in sort of a play situation. And so, you know, I, I, they do have some understanding of human nature. But we had another question that came in from Lee Smith. In these interviews, have any of these experiencers talked about the extraterrestrial presence on Earth? I uh, talked about the extraterrestrial presence on Earth. Yes, they are, uh, even the historical records, and I say the historical, I, from the beginning of the book I talk about historical records, meaning the the old ones starting with Orfeo Angelucci in the 50s. You know, that's not that old, I know, but these people were all, Orfeo Angelucci, Adamski, you might be familiar with some of these people, sure. or Claude Virilian and uh, Billy Myers' stories. Well, they all, they all talk about, you know, um, extraterrestrials and you know after going through all their all of their stories and doing thematic content analysis on that basically there was always a message for mankind also yeah you know and plus were they talking about extra other um, extraterrestrials yes you know the answer to that is yes of, of another presence I mean like if we just want to look at it as a general title of extraterrestrials what are we saying it's like saying you know homo sapiens correct you know we're not looking at them we're not um dissecting it into different cultures we're not dissecting it into different countries you know we're americans you know versus europeans or you know russian you know different culture groups but it's the same thing we're okay. talking about you know it's um so to answer the question yes they do talk about other extraterrestrials that are uh you know, on the Earth plane. Well, we also had a really interesting question from Sandra. She was wondering if you've ever worked with an experiencer who has since mysteriously disappeared, never to be heard from again. Perhaps they, I, I mean, I, my, my interpretation, maybe they left for a happier place. Yeah, or they died, right? I mean, that's well, very possible. Yeah. No. Yeah. I guess, I guess so. But we're, we're sort of coming to the end of the hour here, and I'd really like to hear from you. What What are your conclusions about all of this? Well, where, where do you think we're going with this? Well, we're going to go where we want to go. It's up to the individual. It's a, you know, it's a subjective experience, as far as I'm concerned. And I think it's time to understand. For the people that are willing to understand this phenomenon at a closer level, there's a lot going on out there. You know, the universe, the cosmos, is not a dead place like we thought it was. You know, it's teeming with life. So we need to look at that a little bit more closely and see if we're ready to take that on because we've been so conditioned to believe a certain way. You know, there's a fear factor, and I'm just asking people to maybe, like I was mentioning before, the analogy of cracking the door open a little bit and taking a look and see what's there. Well, yeah, Doug, to that point, Doug just wrote in and was wondering, how can an experiencer know for sure that he or she has had an experience or that it is only a dream? Ah, good question. <laughs> yeah, you know, sometimes people say, well, we're living in a dream, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, in the well, Matrix, you know, right? there's, there's differences, I think, between, you know, uh, on a daily level. When the, you start getting, with the assimilation process, it's, it's just like, if you stay with it, the the answers to your questions will come. The answer to that question, you know, if it's a dream or not, will be superimposed by another event. In other words, over time, you realize the reality of it. And it, that, that, like I said, that assimilation process takes, a, you know, many, many years. Some are quicker than others, but most of the time, like, uh, you know, I'm talking 5, 10, 15, 20, you know, and over years of, you know, working with these situations and experiences that people have had and the individuals themselves, how they keep coming back and understanding their initial experience much differently than they did at the time of the experience. 
because they're usually allowing uh, more open-minded information to come in, and it changes. You know, change is inevitable, correct? Correct. And, I mean, why shouldn't it take that much time? I mean, for example, if you were interested in physics or quantum mechanics, it takes five to ten years to learn that. And you certainly, when you're starting out as a freshman in college, you don't really grasp all of the implications. And uh, so I, it makes sense that it would take a while. And hopefully there's new knowledge coming in all the time, even in the fields yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And I think with that new knowledge, we're more readily uh, able to accept people that are outside of our immediate experience, too. It, it brings us up out of ourselves as well. Well, that's an important aspect is to, like you say, get up out of ourselves. Yeah. Well, I tell you. Get on with the bigger picture. Oh, yeah, really. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm sorry, but we've come to the end of this hour, and I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the time to be here with us. It, it was just a great, uh, great interview, and I thank you sincerely. But how does our audience follow up on the interview, and most importantly, how do they get a copy of your book? Well, my book's available in a number of different ways. Of course, Amazon.com, uh, Barnes & Nobles, and you go directly to the publisher, Bear & Company. Okay. Rochester, Vermont. Yeah. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. And Thank uh, you, Kate. I appreciate everything we've discussed. Uh, oh, it was great. Thank you it very much. Very interesting. Thank you. All right. Bye. Uh, thanks, as always, to Bill and Dave. Thanks to our sponsors. Mainly thank you out there for listening. You can hear the show again Sunday at 4. But better yet, you can subscribe to our still free podcast and keep our numbers up. Have a wonderful weekend. We'll see you next Friday at 1. Our guest will be Chris Holly, catching us up on all the local 